Hello and welcome to Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world in 25 minutes. I'm Tenyola Shoboale. It's a week of grim milestones in the fight against COVID-19 as the number of coronavirus cases globally surpasses 100 million, plus residents in the Netherlands and Lebanon protest lockdown measures. Just over a year since the first cases of the coronavirus were reported in the Chinese city of Wuhan, the number of confirmed cases worldwide has passed 100 million. Despite the development of more effective treatments for the coronavirus and the rollout of vaccines across dozens of countries, variants of the virus recently detected in the United Kingdom, South Africa and Brazil have created uncertainty in the fight against the pandemic. Global coronavirus cases surpassed 100 million on Wednesday. That's a staggering 1.3% of the world's population. Countries across the globe are struggling with new variants of the virus and vaccine shortfalls, while more than 2 million people have died from the disease. The United States, India, Brazil, Russia and the United Kingdom round out the top five worst affected countries. Together, their populations represent over a quarter of the globe, but their case numbers make up more than half of those reported. With over 25 million cases alone, the U.S. has a quarter of all reported COVID-19 cases, though it accounts for just 4% of the world's population. It also leads the world in the number of lives lost to the disease, with over 420,000 deaths, followed by Brazil. In India, the nation with the second highest number of cases, infections have been decreasing but still hover around 13,000 a day on average. And as the worst affected region in the world, Europe is currently reporting a million new infections about every four days and has reported nearly 30 million since the global health crisis began. For leaders everywhere, vaccines are the light at the end of the tunnel. Although rollouts have started in about 56 countries, vaccine distribution across the world remains unequal. Africa, which accounts for nearly 3.5 million cases and over 85,000 deaths, is still scrambling to secure vaccine supplies. During this week's Davos Agenda meeting, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa warned against vaccine nationalism. The rich countries of the world went out and acquired large doses of vaccines from the developers and manufacturers of these vaccines. And some countries have even gone beyond and acquired up to four times what their population needs. And that was aimed at hoarding these vaccines. And now this is being done to the exclusion of countries, of other countries in the world that most need this. We are all not safe if some countries are vaccinating their people and other countries are not vaccinating. We all must act together in combating uh, coronavirus because it affects all of us equally. Many European countries are facing shipment delays from major vaccine makers like AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Governments say the supply issues were costing critical time during the early stages of the rollout to care homes and hospital staff. Some EU leaders have threatened legal action against the companies. We want clarity on transactions and full transparency concerning the export of vaccines from the EU. In the future, all companies producing vaccines against COVID-19 in the EU will have to provide early notification whenever they want to export vaccines to third countries. Humanitarian deliveries are, of course, not affected by this. The European Union will take any action required to protect its citizens and rights. Meanwhile, a new threat has emerged, COVID-19 variants. One first identified in Britain and another in South Africa, which is 50% more infectious and now spreading in at least 20 countries. The United Kingdom has become the first country in Europe 
to record more than 100,000 coronavirus-related deaths. It follows a surge in cases last month as the government battles to speed up vaccination delivery and keep new variants of the coronavirus at bay. It's a terrible milestone and one that represents unimaginable loss. The 100,000 marker is more than the UK's civilian toll in World War II. The UK is the first European nation to pass the landmark. Go, go, go. Only the United States, Brazil, India and Mexico have reported a higher coronavirus death toll. Amid criticism over the country's handling of the pandemic, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says he takes full responsibility for everything that the government has done. On this day, I should just really repeat that I am deeply sorry for every uh, life that has been lost. And of course, as, as, uh, as Prime Minister, I take full responsibility for everything that the government uh, has done. What I can tell you is that uh, we truly did everything we could and continue to do everything that we can uh, to minimise loss of life and to minimise suffering in what has been a very, very difficult uh, stage uh, and a very, very difficult crisis for our country. And we will, uh, we will continue to do that, uh, just as every government that is affected uh, by this crisis around the world uh, is continuing uh, to do the same. The UK is in its third national lockdown and is battling a surge in infections and subsequent hospitalizations and deaths caused by a more transmittable variant of the virus. There are few differences from the spring, when Britain suffered a devastating first wave and were put under a draconian lockdown. They are now asking themselves how they got here yet again. I feel, I feel disappointed. I feel like we could have done more quicker to stop, stop the spread. I feel a little bit, I guess, I guess embarrassed really, you know. Um, that it's got to this point. Other countries in Europe, I, I believe they've done better and they should have acted faster. Like, I don't think that uh, opening the shops in November, December, I think it was a huge mistake. And I don't believe it has anything to do with the new um, strain of the virus. So yeah, I think things are bad. It's a date of birth? 23, 1, 44. But in some positives, the UK has earned cautious early praise for its vaccine rollout which has seen it produce double the number of vaccinations per person per day of any other European country. Over 6.8 million people have received the first of two doses. The government has said the vaccination rate and the success of the vaccinations are key to being able to ease restrictions. Also on Tuesday, Indonesia officially surpassed 1 million coronavirus cases, a grim milestone for the Southeast Asian nation that has struggled since last March to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control. It's a familiar situation across the world, but no less shocking. In Indonesia, the hospitals are full of patients gasping for breath and graves are being hastily dug. The Southeast Asian nation officially passing a grim milestone Tuesday, one million coronavirus cases. This condition is already a warning and at a dangerous level. At most, we treat more than 120 patients a day. It is important that we apply health protocols, such as washing hands, maintaining social distance, and wearing masks, because with these actions, we can prevent the spread of the virus. The world's fourth most populous country has struggled since last March to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control. Deaths from the respiratory disease now totals over 28,460. Those numbers are among the highest across Asia. Health experts believe the true spread of the disease could be three times higher. West Java has been facing some of the highest infection rates across the country. This situation is very worrying. Maybe it's the lack of public awareness, but in my opinion, People just don't want to know about the situation or they don't care about it. Things like wearing masks and washing hands should be compulsory, but even in big cities, they don't consider it as an obligation. The Indonesian government started a mass vaccination campaign and tightened movement restrictions earlier this month. It can come soon enough as hospitals come under mounting strain.
dozens of COVID-19 patients have reportedly been turned away due to a lack of beds and ventilators. The pandemic has forced governments to order shutdowns, curfews, travel bans and other public health restrictions to try and stem the spread of infections. But over a year later, as the world continues the battle against COVID-19, residents seem to have had enough of lockdown measures. In the Netherlands on Monday, police arrested at least 70 people after rioting broke out for a third night. The unrest started over the weekend after the government imposed a nighttime curfew aimed at curving the spread of COVID-19. In Rotterdam, anti-lockdown demonstrators started fires and clashed with police in protest of a new nighttime curfew. There were similar scenes in Amsterdam as well as several other cities. The 9 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. curfew came into force on Saturday evening to curb the spread of coronavirus. It's the country's first nationwide curfew since World War II. Many say it's not necessary as cases of COVID-19 are falling in the Netherlands with the lowest number of cases reported on Monday since December 1st. I think we should be allowed to live our lives, to be honest. I think it's, there, is, there, is a, there is a virus out there, but I don't, for, I don't think the world should be shut down for it. I think we should just be, it can be contained and I think we should be allowed to live our lives and all the shops should be open. I think the people should just open up and live, up, live our lives. That's my honest opinion. Yeah, the, the, the lockdown, the curfew, everything that's going on and especially uh, all the riots uh, here in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, well, yeah, it feels a bit unreal actually. It feels a bit unreal, like a, like a, like a, like a bad movie. But with fears over the highly contagious UK variant of the disease spreading, some residents agree that tougher measures are necessary at this time. It's uh, completely strange that things are getting out of hand. Uh, people are losing their mind. Um, it's some, well, I can imagine it in some way, but we all have to deal with the same situation here. And I think that we have to remain calm. And I think the government is doing a great thing, keeping things under control and uh, making for all of us as soon to be getting outside as soon as possible we can. The unrest started over the weekend when protesters in several cities looted stores, started fires and clashed with police. In one case, knives were thrown at police and a COVID-19 testing station was burnt down. The event resulted in 240 arrests and thousands of fines were handed out for defying the curfew. Schools and non-essential shops in the Netherlands have been shut since mid-December, following the closure of bars and restaurants two months earlier. Countries worldwide are feeling the strain, but the crisis is particularly acute in Lebanon, where the pandemic is piled in on top of a financial collapse and the aftermath of a huge port blast in August. Now, amid a month-long nationwide lockdown, residents have taken to the streets to voice their anger. Angry residents took to the streets on Tuesday, as Lebanon is in the middle of its strictest lockdown since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Demonstrators in Beirut raised slogans holding the political class responsible for economic collapse. Protesters, many of whom say the lockdown is increasing their poverty, set cars alight and hurled stones at soldiers, who in turn responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. Many say they've been unable to cope with the nearly month-long lockdown with little or no government assistance. The lockdown is in place until February the 8th. As well as battling the aftermath of the Beirut port blast last year, Lebanon, a country of nearly 5 million and over 1 million refugees, is going through an unprecedented economic crisis that precedes the pandemic and restrictions imposed to combat it. The currency has tumbled, losing over 80% of its value. Banks have imposed controls on withdrawals and transfers, and unemployment and inflation skyrocketed. Meanwhile, coronavirus infections surged in recent weeks, partially blamed on government measures to relax restrictions during the holiday season when tens of thousands of expat Lebanese were visiting. Hospitals have since registered near full occupancy of ICU beds and supplies are running out. The cash-strapped government struggles to provide assistance to the crisis-struck population, half of which have been driven into poverty, mostly over the last year. When Foreign Dispatches returns in just a moment, Thousands of Indian farmers protesting against agricultural reforms breached barricades to enter the historic Red Fort complex in the capital. Please stay with us.
You're still watching Foreign Dispatches on Channel's television. To another major protest that erupted this week, but this time not focused on the COVID-19 lockdown measures, but India's agriculture reforms. On Tuesday, thousands of farmers in India clashed with the police at Delhi's historic Red Fort complex. The protests formed part of a huge rally that was planned to coincide with the country's Republic Day. Thousands of Indian farmers stormed the historic Red Fort complex in the capital, one even swinging from a flagpole to the sound of cheers as violence escalated elsewhere. The farmers are angry about new laws that they say help large private buyers at their expense. Protesters also charged at the police with sticks who in turn used their batons and tear gas shells to disperse them. The clashes were preceded by a convoy of tens of thousands of farmers driving their tractors through the fringes of the city. Hundreds, some on horseback, broke away from the main route approved by police to head for central Delhi, saying they want to reach the capital to get their message to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The protests coincided with India's Republic Day and threatened to overshadow the annual military parade. For almost two months, the farmers have been camping outside New Delhi in protest of the agricultural reforms. The government says the reforms will liberalize the agriculture sector, but farmers say it puts their livelihoods at risk. Agriculture employs about half of India's population of 1.3 billion, and unrest among an estimated 150 million land-owning farmers worries the government. The protests pose one of the biggest challenges to Prime Minister Narendra Modi since he came to power in 2014. Nine rounds of talks with farmers' unions have failed to end the protests. And farm leaders have rejected government's offer to delay the laws for 18 months, making the push for repeal instead. Meanwhile, in solidarity with the farmers in India, in the United States, the Sikh community in New York City also took to the streets to voice their anger at the agricultural reforms. As the farmers' protest is continuing to grow bigger in the country, people not only from India but from across the globe are standing in solidarity with them. On Tuesday, Sikh demonstrators gathered outside the Consulate General of India in New York to protest the controversial set of agricultural laws in India which farmers see as laws that help large private buyers at the expense of producers. All the bills are for the farmers and what we want is to, to take it back. There's hundreds of thousands of people that are in, the, in today's rally that are protect, uh, protesting to get back what we want. We want the MST to drop how it was before. We want the Monday system to come back as well. And here we are in front of the Indian Embassy to, to have the same thing what we want from India. We want our rights. We want them to take back what they approved, which the farmers haven't approved at all. Around half of India's population works in agriculture and unrest among the estimated 150 million land-owning farmers represents one of the biggest challenges to the authority of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi since it came to power in 2014. The government's offer to delay the farm laws for 18 months has been rejected by farm leaders who want a total repeal of the laws. Other solidarity protests have been held around the United States in the last two months in cities including Houston and San Francisco. Let's go over to the Middle East now where preparations for the Dubai World Expo 2020 are on track. Already delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, officials are determined to make it a spectacular and one-of-a-kind event. Our correspondent, Maywa Adegoki, tells us all about it. With high hopes and a determination to host the World Expo 2020 this October, the Dubai government opens the expo site to allow residents a sneak peek. Terra, the pavilion promoting sustainability, one of the three themes of the expo is first to go on display in the build-up to World Expo 2020. Designed by renowned Grimshaw architects, it sets an example for sustainable building design. 
It is built to be net zero for both energy and water and features 1,055 photovoltaic panels arranged on a 130 meter wide roof canopy and atop a series of energy trees. While the pavilion highlights the urgency of addressing negative environmental impacts caused by human behavior, it also features solutions using humor to help future generations break the cycle of consumerism and become agents of change. Now more than ever, the impact that we are expecting is not only economic. We're talking about social, we're talking about culture, we're talking about also the way we think about the new world that we're living in. Um, and how to deal with different pandemics or any other challenges that might face humanity. Um, so there are huge expectations on this expo and we have promised the world to deliver something meaningful, impactful and exceptional and we believe we are on the road to delivering that. Despite many countries still having a hard time managing the pandemic, organizers are confident there won't be a second postponement of the event, initially scheduled for October 2020. We are highly optimistic that the human beings can persevere and find uh, great ways and solutions um, in the challenges that are thrown against them. And I think Dubai Expo 2020 is going to be a great platform where people will be connected. We are going to connect the world together again and uh, hopefully bring about a better future for everyone. Twenty-five million visitors are expected during the course of the six-month event. How to keep them safe is something organizers say they are working on. We have worked with our partners, um, our international participants, to ensure that we can give out an experience that is safe and also that is interesting and that is meaningful. Um, so that balance is something that we are currently working on we are continuously working on so there are is going to be a lot of these different technological touches that are going to help enhance our experience um, in terms of a virtual expo, in terms of our distancing and also getting the experience of different events through monitors or um, through different means with global economy still reeling from the impact of the pandemic Strong collaborations will be needed for the world to get back on its feet. And that's exactly what organizers of the Expo 2020 Dubai hope this platform will provide a connection for the future. From here at the Expo site in Dubai, Mayawa Adigoke for Channels Television. And finally on the program, a lot of work and effort has gone into making coronavirus tests available to the masses during the ongoing global pandemic. And a company in the United States has a clever solution, vending machines. Take a look. It's a first of its kind in the US, a vending machine that offers COVID-19 home test kits to the public. The vending machine in New York City is contactless and the test is self-administered. According to the company, Wellness for Humanity, the RT-PCR saliva tests are 99% accurate and the rapid antigen test is 97.4% accurate. The idea is simple. Buy the test online, receive a barcode and show it to the scanner on the vending machine. Results take about two days. With the world Just still like battling it. the deadly coronavirus pandemic, our, similar uh, vending machines have also been installed and in Hong Kong uh, and the UK. It looks just like this. Um, this is our uh, PCR saliva. And essentially, uh, as soon as you get home, you would open this. Uh, inside there, um, you just simply need a scoop of saliva to be able to uh, have the result. It comes with a um, shipping label back, so all you have to do is just drop it off at your local FedEx and uh, you're good to go. Results take anywhere from 24 to 48 hours and uh, something that we also will have in the future is uh, expedited um, results so that way travelers or people in immediate need can benefit from it. 
The test said $119 and could be covered by insurance. The company says the goal of the automated vending machines is to give anyone who needs a test access to one. And that's the program today. Always remember that you can catch up with all our top stories on channelstv.com. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Teniola Shubo Ale. See you next time.